thanks for sticking with us, everyone. I know we're kind of just getting our science legs underneath us again. I think <laughs> I might have said that like a true cartographer. Um, but are you uh, are you ready to break down the science? I'll hand it over to Jeff to kick us off. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the top, this is one of my favorite movies. This is one of my dad's favorite movies. Um, when I was a kid, as I mentioned, we had a uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind pinball machine from 1978. Um, so that's a, a picture of uh, myself and uh, my grandpa, my dad's dad, uh, on our very, very 80s couch uh, with the pinball machine in the background and a couple of close-ups on uh, some stock footage of the pinball machine. So was uh, it a this good pinball... pinball machine? What? Was it a good pinball machine? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was very, I mean, you know, it was very circa late 70s. So it was, you know, uh, the numbers uh, for the score were seven segment LED displays, but that was the only digital aspect. Everything else was mechanical and it was, you know, one layer, one ball, two flippers, you know, very simple in that kind of regard. Not quite as simple as some from like the 40s and 50s, um, but very standard sort of 70s era. Um, it's how I got into pinball, how I learned to play pinball and get into the history of pinball. But it's also how I learned how to read a circuit diagram and basic electronics because uh, it broke all the time, uh, you know, by the 80s and 90s. And so I learned how to read those diagrams and replace the fuses with my dad and learned about, you know, NAND gates and all that kind of good stuff from this machine. <laughs> uh, just one other thing. Um, shout out to that bar in the back left background, too. That's that that was styling. a very very sweet aspect of of the old house I grew up in in Anaheim right near Disneyland. Yeah, it was that bar back there. That was very cool too. <laughs> All right. So, moving on uh to UFOs. Um so first off some terminology. UFOs of course are unidentified flying objects. Uh so that means that it's anything that's unidentified that's in the sky, basically. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, ufology is the study of the reports, visual records, purported evidence, and other phenomena related to UFOs. Uh, in ufology, a close encounter is an event is an event in which a person witnesses a UFO that comes within 500 feet of them. That's the official definition. Uh, this term was coined by astronomer and UFO researcher J. Allen Hynek in 1972, so not too much, uh, too many years before this movie even came out. And he defined the three types of close encounters. Uh, the close encounter of the first kind are visual sightings of a UFO, again, where they're seemingly less than 500 feet away. Uh, a close encounter of the second kind is a UFO event in which a physical event uh, is claimed. So this is, you know, interference in the function of a vehicle or electronic devices, which we see in the movie multiple times. Animals reacting, uh, a physiological effect, paralysis, heat, getting a sunburn, uh, things like that. Um, or if there's a physical trace, so like think crop circles, things like that. Um, and then, of course, the close encounter of the third kind is when there's a physical entity present uh, with the UFO. So that can be humanoids, robots, humans who are occupants or pilots of the UFO, things like that. So this movie should have been called Close Encounters of the First, Second and Third Kind. Yes, yes. It sort of builds through all three kinds throughout the movie. So there you go. Um the number of reported UFO sightings was actually one of the basically the highest in recorded history in the 90s. Um, it did have a local peak around 2012, 2014, uh, but it's been declining significantly since then. And it actually has been uh, quite low uh, since the 90s. Um, one possible cause of this is, of course, nowadays, pretty much everyone um, has a high resolution camera and a recording device in their pockets. And so if there were real UFO sightings, they would be easily corroborated by many people. And so they're not just they're just not happening. Um, surprisingly, the decrease might also be due to stuff being released by the government itself. Um, things like this. Uh, here are some clips of a UFO from November of 2004. Uh, this image, uh, these videos were shot by Navy pilots from the USS Nimitz off the coast of San Diego. And they were released uh, just a few years ago, 2017-2018, uh, um, and have been confirmed by the Navy as real. These are, you know, this is real footage of a UFO. Is it of extraterrestrial origin? 
I would say probably not, but it is indeed an unidentified flying object. And so the idea is that if the government is being relatively open about UFO encounters and this kind of footage, then ufologists can't claim a big government cover-up exists. And so this conspiracy aspect is thought to have been a big driver over the years of, of UFO sightings, things like that. And everyone should get ready because we're going to have even more official government information about UFOs very soon. Uh, this past December, when the last coronavirus relief package uh, was uh, signed into law, it had a bunch of government funding stuff in it and a few other things in that package, including the beginning of a six month window for U.S. intelligence to tell Congress what they know about UFOs. So now we are literally we are forcing U.S. intelligence to tell people in Congress about UFOs. So maybe they'll believe the real stuff and not conspiracy theories. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But the director of national intelligence and the secretary of uh, Intel uh, national intelligence must provide the congressional uh, intelligence and armed services committees with unclassified reports about unidentified aerial phenomena, which uh, NSW pointed out is the current term used in the government for UFOs. Uh, so that's a cool leftover from 2020 that we will uh, see in the next few months. I look forward to the Ologies podcast with Allie Ward, where she has an ufologist on. I, I also you like go. how you pronounced it like at least three different ways. Oh, this yeah. is clearly oh, yeah. the worst ology to be associated <laughs> with, just from a pronunciation standpoint. Uh, all right, let's talk about conspiracy theories. Uh, but uh, I'm going to just go with a strong nope on this. This is too far for me, so I'm going to tone it down. Uh, by sticking to the conspiracy theories in the film. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, Flight 19, which was a set of, of fighter jets uh, that took off from Fort Lauderdale, uh, they flew on a, a practice bombing run to the Bahamas. Uh, they were supposed to re uh, turn to uh, point three here in this, uh, in this image uh, and return home. Due to bad weather, they had trouble navigating which direction they were going. Radio transmissions indicated they were in area four, which is pretty far off route and like and they were likely running out of fuel. A rescue mission launched from uh, spot number five, but crashed at point six. Um, so we don't actually uh, know exactly where they were lost, but they were pretty far off course when they last found it. Um, the Cotopaxi was a, a freighter that was sailing to Cuba, uh, but was lost a couple days out of port uh, as it was reported to be taking on water. Uh, every few years, anytime a wreck is actually found in that area, stories reemerge about the Cotopaxi being found, including this one that came about just a couple years ago uh, that ended up on thousands of websites indicating it had been found, but it proved not to be true. But I think the biggest conspiracy theory uh, in this movie actually wasn't in this movie. It came from Steven Spielberg himself. Uh, so let me unmute and uh, play this guy. Uh, there is a rumor that was in U Oops, sorry. U.S. News and World Report a number of months ago that uh, Jimmy Carter might make a uh, uh, make some unsettling disclosures about the UFO phenomena sometime in December. Uh, it's perfect timing. I opened my movie in December, so it's perfect timing. So this idea that he's purporting about Jimmy Carter seeing a UFO emerged because years earlier in 1969, and this is the actual document that Jimmy Carter filed with the International UFO Bureau, uh, that in Leary, Georgia, that he witnessed a white round object that approached his position before stopping and then receding into the distance. Uh, Carter was with 12 other people at the time, all of whom witnessed the same thing. He filed a, this report and uh, Steven Spielberg picked it up and I guess popularized it because uh, there's no such thing as uh, bad press for this movie. All right. So talking about those planes and boats and abductees from the 40s, 50s, et cetera, uh, that didn't seem to age at all. What's up with that? Well, if we assume that the alien spaceships were cruising around the solar system or maybe the whole galaxy at speeds near the speed of light after picking up all these people and equipment, then this actually makes scientific sense. This comes from uh, what's known as Einstein's theory of special relativity, which says, among other things, that time passes more slowly for things that are moving fast. 
or in other words, moving clocks tick slower. And so this phenomenon is called time dilation, and it's been observed in identical pairs of atomic clocks where one was flown on a plane or a rocket at high speeds, while the other one was stationary on Earth. Um, in addition, this effect needs to be corrected, uh, corrected for in GPS satellites, because satellites are moving very fast. Uh, if it weren't corrected uh, in GPS satellites, then your GPS in your phone and, and in your, uh, you know, other GPS devices wouldn't work, and all maps would act like Apple Maps. So that would be bad. Um, this is also the cause of the so-called twin paradox, which is sort of what this cartoon is showing us here. Uh, if you have a pair of twins, uh, fraternal in this case at least, uh, and send one off in a rocket ship that travels near the speed of light uh, and keep the other one on Earth, then the rocket riding twin can return after a while and a relatively small amount of time will elapse for her, uh, while a much longer amount of time has elapsed on Earth for that twin. And so they'll actually be different ages. Uh, and this has been observed in a real live set of twins, uh, good old astronauts Mark and Scott Kelly. Um, back in July of 2016, uh, when Scott landed back on Earth after a total of 520 days in orbit, where he was moving at an average speed of 17,500 miles an hour, he was actually, he aged less than his brother that stayed on Earth. And so Mark used to be six minutes older than Scott, but when Scott landed after his uh, space mission, he was actually six minutes and five milliseconds older. So a small effect when you're just moving at a mere 17,500 miles an hour. But in the movie, if the aliens were moving at a pretty good clip close to the speed of light, then maybe all those people and equipment that were abducted didn't age very much at all in those uh, 40 years or so. And that is totally reasonable and scientifically plausible. Uh, so let's get to the structural part of the movie. And by that, I mean, of course, uh, talking about mashed potato sculptures. Uh, it is a legitimate art form. Uh, so hear me out. People often think um, uh, uh, think uh, make turkeys out of mashed potatoes. I think it's very seasonal. But if you want to be more fancy, you can make a, uh, a, <laughs> a sculpture of a sumo wrestler or a rose. I think that rose is really quite beautiful because they used purple potatoes. It looks like it in the um, a, in the creation of this. Of course, The Simpsons did it and made a uh, a riff of this movie where Homer carves a circus tent. And now people have posted many of their Simpsons recreations of mashed potato sculptures. Um, I found three separate mashed potato, mashed potato sculpture contests in the U.S., but the largest is Potato Days in Barnesville that includes mashed potato wrestling, which actually sounds like a lot of fun. Um, that event is on hiatus uh, due to the pandemic, but they say they are going to return uh, either this year or in 2022. So excellent. mark your calendars. Book your tickets now. Okay. Back to what I was really going to talk about, which is the geology of Devil's Tower, uh, no apostrophe. Uh, and what's kind of amazing is that we still don't really know how it formed. There's four different theories, uh, some of which have, you know, different sort of uh, uh, numbers of scientists uh, subscribing to it. So the first is uh, what's called the stock theory, uh, which is that essentially a small intrusive body formed by magma. Uh, and cooled underground and was later exposed by erosion around it. Uh, now, generally speaking, uh, most scientists don't think that's actually true now. Uh, the second is in the bottom uh, left, the lacolith, which is a large kind of mushroom-shaped mass of igneous rock. Um, and this was a really popular theory in the 1900s uh, because there are other lacolith formations that were found in uh, in this kind of uh, western area uh, and that it would slowly um, uh, erode down to what we see. Uh, this is kind of, this is somewhat fallen out of uh, favor with many geologists in, in recent times. There's a volcanic plug theory that this was uh, the neck of an extinct volcano. Um, and evidence of volcanic activity in the area, and the plug slowly eroded down, leaving what we see here. Um, but there is no other like volcanic ash and debris nearby that would um, assert that this was a um, extinct volcano. The one that's gained a lot of traction in the last decade is something called the Mar Diatreme theory, uh, where geologist Prokop Zavada um, uh, said that essentially what happened was 
magma came up encountered groundwater which became steam and while it was trapped underground exploded creating a crater and that crater filled with lava then which then cooled and solidified um, and slowly eroded down into a dome over time uh, and uh, that erosion would wear away in a certain pattern and he, uh, the reason they think this is a popular theory, there's certain sort of rock formations on the side of Devil's Tower that usually form a lot faster than what we would see um, from some of these other theories. So this idea of something that would be a much quicker uh, rock formation uh, could explain what it is. But even this has a number of detractors to it. So uh, at the end of the day, we still just don't know. All right, on to music. I talked a bit about it during the show, and it's one of the highlights of the movie for me, honestly. Uh, and so the idea of music being the universal language, as in everyone in the universe can communicate via music, is not a new idea. Um, you know, 2,600 years ago, Pythagoras and others were talking about musica universalis, or universal music, as a philosophical concept that the movements of uh, celestial bodies like the sun, the moon, the planets can be understood as a form of music in that they have natural frequencies and they can be described by mathematical harmonics, really connecting the mathematics of music with motions of heavenly bodies and other uh, observables in uh, nature. Uh, this idea persisted through the Renaissance and beyond. Uh, sometimes it's also referred to as music of the spheres. I know in the chat people were talking about there's a summer music series at Lick Observatory in uh, San Jose referred to as music of the spheres. Uh, and people have tried to apply it to all kinds of celestial objects and phenomena in, in nature. Um, more recently, um, in the late 70s, uh, Voyager 1 and 2 were launched in 1977, the same year this movie came out, to explore the solar system and beyond. And aboard both satellites is the famous Voyager Golden Record. Uh, the records contain uh, images on them, but the actual records can be played, and they contain sounds um, selected to portray the diversity of life and culture on Earth. Uh, it has recordings of hello in a number of languages. And the idea is they're intended for any intelligent extraterrestrial life form uh, who might find them to be able to look at them and listen to them. Um, as for the music on the record specifically, it includes music by Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Stravinsky, gospel singer Blind Willie Johnson, and good old Chuck Berry. Connecting us is back, the Chuck to, Berry back in to the there future. In case Mike, Michael J. Fox, co yeah, it comes across it. That's right. That's right. We're both in, making in the same joke. Time time traveling uh, aliens obviously want to make sure that Chuck Berry and Marty McFly uh, are well represented. Uh, light, let's talk about glass shattering, which is a, a scene we saw early on when they played that big note. There's three essential types of glass breaking. There's one which uh, the physics girl Diana Cowan is demonstrating in, in the upper left, which is resonant frequency. Uh, the frequency that the glass actually vibrates. If you can produce such a tone, the glass will vibrate and with enough vibration break. Uh, the second is what most people call spontaneous breaking, uh, but essentially there's microscopic defects in the glass itself. So even though they may not be visible to the naked eye, they can lead to glass shattering in a way that one crack can actually propagate the series of microscopic cracks in a way that leads to a, uh, a quick destruction. But what actually happened um, in the movie was a shock wave hitting the gaffs, uh, hitting the glass. And he, it's a wave of air being propagated uh, by a sound source uh, pushing until the glass shatters. Uh, and here's what happens when you do that in real life uh, during an air show in Brazil. Uh, oops. Uh, that was a library uh, uh, that now has a lot of broken windows. Womp, womp. All right. Can we spend a minute talking about Richard Dreyfuss's face? And it's not because <laughs> he has a naturally funny face, because he does. He absolutely he does. does. He does. Uh, but we're all thinking about this weird half sunburn he got and how much energy it would have taken to do this. Welcome to our recurring segment. We did the math. Uh, okay. So sunburns are caused by UV rays from the sun. This image, which is definitely not to scale, shows three different types of UV radiation that impacts us. UVB is the one that we're going to focus on here because it's the one that causes sunburn. So we'll focus on that. The UV index is actually a uh, it's an index from one to 12 that takes into account solar radiation 
uh, in the UVB range of wavelengths, a constant that is sort of, you know, maps to that scale, and a coefficient of what's called arrhythmia, which is essentially our generic sensitivity of human skin uh, to that form of radiation. From that, we can actually calculate the intensity of UVB light um, and uh, the radiation dose that then you get, uh, which includes time and intensity. Uh, but human skin varies in melanin content, which is a UVB absorber. So welcome to the weirdest scientific scale ever invented. Uh, <laughs> for ease of communication, I'm going to refer to skin type one uh, uh, in the, uh, I'm going to use skin type one in this calculation, and I'm going to refer to it as white people, um, for this, uh, discussion based on other research, which is, uh, way too wonky to get into here. Uh, the intensity of UV light that will cause a first degree sunburn, uh, is about 85 kilowatts per meter squared, um, uh, in a, in a human, uh, let's call the exposure time as about 30 seconds. It was actually much shorter than that in the film, but we'll just call it about 30 seconds. I think that is a reasonable time frame. Uh, that results in an intensity of 2.83 kilowatts per meter squared. That's a ton of radiation. By the way, the average of intensity of UVB radiation at noon on a summer day in San Francisco is this much. Uh, so that is a uh, a few factors. That's about a factor of 7,000 difference. Um, here is a simulation of what that intensity of light would look like if it hit human skin. Um, I, I It's actually, a, a, you know I'm joking here. Uh, it's actually well below the heat threshold for a radiation death dose. But the air surrounding Richard Dreyfuss's face, if that was the intensity that hit him, would have heated up to about 150 to 200 degrees in the area. So not only would he have had um, a sunburn from the UVB do dose, he would actually have legitimate burns on his skin uh, from from the air heating up around him. I love it. Anytime we can get in the, the face melting. All right. We talked about this a few times throughout the movie. Uh, I think one of the parts of this movie I really like is the government conspiracy cover up stuff is like really well done and really smart. Uh, you know, they talk about what would scare people away from the area where the aliens are coming in. Uh, this clip that we're showing here of like, oh, we got to move these government trucks around. What are we going to do? Well, they could be unmarked blank trucks, but like, no, let's just use really big American corporations at the time. Piggly Wiggly, Coca-Cola, Baskin Robbins. Nobody will think twice if they see one of those driving around town. So I love it. I think it's hilarious. It's a great part of this movie. Uh, this is also Jeff's running gag where he tracks uh, uh brand placement, placement in movies yep. that we watch <laughs> it is also one of my obsessions in big screen science yes <laughs> <laughs> all right so given all of that uh you know government conspiracies and alien abductions what have we learned kishore uh so first of all i think like the whole like everyday carry and prep kits for alien abductions is all wrong you just need sunscreen and earplugs yeah that checks out uh i mean I think, you know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a quote. It would be inexcusably in egocentric to suggest that we are alone in the cosmos, which I agree with. But he also goes on to say that it is a separate statement from saying that we have been visited by aliens giving rectal exams. So I think there's a bit of a, a difference between there's probably life out there and, yeah, they're abducting people and doing stuff to their butts. You know, that might not be my favorite NDT quote, but it, it's up there. I'll give him that. <laughs> Um, seriously, why did they take the dog? Like, what? what's the point of taking the dog? I don't understand. I'm still bothered by it. I, um, of all, like, the, the seemingly nice things these aliens did, uh, why did they take the dog? It's just not cool. Not cool. Yeah. I don't know. All right. We got to give this a rating. I think we give this, uh, our highest Richard Dreyfus-based ratings to Dreyfus's Taunting Jaws. <laughs> so, the is that a dry fi or dry physicists? I don't know. It doesn't have uh, an how many apostrophe. apostrophes? Yeah, if he's geographically <laughs> based, he doesn't have an apostrophe. <laughs> we went for the same joke. I love it. So uh, good. We are clearly in uh, mid season form uh, for coming back. Thanks, everyone, <laughs> um, for sticking with us uh, uh, for the return of Big Screen Science. We'll be back in two weeks with Young Frankenstein. Um, yep. 
which is a movie we've never done before that we've intended to. And it's a movie that both of us love. Uh, so if you're in, in for some uh, delightful Mel, Mel Brooks comedy uh, and Cloris Leachman, right? Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. She's uh, the best. One of the best movies. Also, one of the few uh, Mel Brooks movies that uh, has uh, uh, stand <laughs> stands the test of time when it comes to appropriate <laughs> jokes <laughs> for this day and age. Um, and I would say even better than Willy Wonka, best Gene Wilder performance ever. Oh, bold statement. I'm a big fan of Blazing Saddles personally, but uh, I think this is better than Blazing Saddles. All right. All right. We can, All right, we but can discuss thanks. in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, we could discuss in a couple weeks. We'll be back on Wednesday in a couple weeks. So I think that's the 17th. So yeah. uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us. And uh, I hope everyone has an awesome night. We'll see you then. Yeah. Glad to be back. This was super fun, everybody. See you in a couple weeks. Yeah. Happy belated birthday again, Jeff's dad. <laughs>